Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me and Essie today. So excited to have her uh, to share with you her insight about how to uh, raise money from the early stage investors as you all, many of you are probably entrepreneurs. Raising money is part of the job. And I think we all roughly know what the investors want, but how do you convince, how do you communicate to the investor effectively so that it, they understand what's your value proposition and how you can uh, help them achieve their goal as well. So SC Modi is the expert in that. And I mean, earlier, briefly, uh, we talked about what her background, but SC Modi is the managing partner of Mighty Capital. It's a Silicon Valley venture capital firm. And she's also the managing partner for Products That Count, which is one of the largest and um, most influential network of product managers in the world. So she's the master in marketing your product and so which requires a lot of communication and one other thing is that we were fortunate to have sc as one of our guests for our podcast so feel free to check out uh, our conversation i uh, think my team hermenia will send you the link to the podcast and with that i will have sc take over all right thank you very much christine oh, and can i, oh, can I interrupt go ahead. sorry i forgot yes. to mention uh, feel free to ask any question along along the, the, the way uh, as he will answer your question. So if you can put in your Q&A uh, in the Q&A box in the, on the link below. So with that, go ahead. Excellent. And on that point about questions, um, I will answer as many questions as we have time for, uh, and I'll try to keep my presentation uh, really to the point. Um, if I don't answer your question, or if you have more questions, you want to follow up with me, you can see my email down here in the in the name. And so feel free to, to send me an email. And then as far as when I'm going to take questions here, the uh, Christine and her team uh, asked that I take questions like not sort of all the time so that for people who are going to be watching the replay, it's uh, it's easy to digest. So I'll break a couple times during the presentation. We'll go through the questions and, and answer a few. Um, okay, so uh, I will uh, start by sharing my screen. Uh, really, uh, my goal is to share with you what investors want so that you can raise money on your own terms. Uh, we'll see uh, during the course of this presentation how important it is to have good terms when you raise money from, from venture. Um, I'll, I'll have two, two pieces, two key kind of sections in this presentation. One is a series of myth busters um, because I speak with a lot of entrepreneurs who have uh, uh, some misconceptions, sorry, about raising money. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, a bit of myth busters. And then after that, I'll share with you how I think about uh, raising money effectively. And during that second portion, I, I will draw a parallel between the work that you as CEO do every day, which is you sell your product to a customer and how that's kind of parallel to you selling your equity to an investor, i.e. raising money. And so I'll take that, sort of that product driven approach uh, because I have product background, so it made sense to me when I uh, when I put together these few slides. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, my background, Christine already went through that. I ran this venture firm, Mighty Capital. We've raised um, a couple of funds. They've been oversubscribed. We're actively deploying uh, the capital, investing money. So if you're raising money, I would love to speak with you. You can email me. Uh, this past year, we had. Uh, three of our portfolio companies go IPO. Uh, you can see their, their logos here on the, on the left. I also started a, a network, Products That Count, which has grown to be um, a product acceleration platform. So we reach about 20% of, uh, 
of all product managers. And so uh, it is a sort of everything product, right? So if there was something in my in my tombstone, it would be this, right? In the in the next decade, the the best product wins, um, and that's been so accelerated by uh, the COVID uh, situation that it's uh, kind of a perfect timing. We call that the age of product, but that's for another talk. And then <clears throat> um, my transition between you know a dozen years building products and companies myself to now being an investor was writing a, a book on what makes a great product. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. The essence of the book is that technology is an extension of ourselves. And so if we want to build a great technology product, we have to think about what makes a great person. And so I look at the, the mind, body, spirit of great technology products. So yes, uh, Christine was uh, chatting with me earlier saying, well, Facebook's not popular very much these days. Ah, uh, yes, on paper, but the biggest successes uh, always have their haters. It is still um, a, a massive uh, company, a massive success and a lot of entrepreneurs want to be the next Zuck, right? The next Mark Zuckerberg. So uh, I spent a few years there um, and, and still struggle to explain the success. Uh, so uh, I wanna share with you some of the, some of the myths that I think uh, go around in, in Silicon Valley and beyond. Number one being, hey, you don't need a degree to be successful. Number two, build it in the, and they will come. You don't need sales, you don't need marketing. And then number three, keep control, don't rely on your investors, they have no value. So let's jump into the first one, which is really like saying business owners don't need a college degree to be successful. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Um, when you look at the pool of people with a degree who are successful entrepreneurs versus the pool of people without a degree who are successful entrepreneurs, you actually uh, see a, a massive difference in uh, that uh, people with a degree are six times more likely to be successful as business owners than people without a degree, despite some of the exceptions, like the photos that you see at the bottom here, people who are dropouts, but that's really the exception, not the rule, and that's why they're featured in the press. So when I uh, talk to, to students, that's usually what I, what I tell them. You're in the right place. Uh, keep studying if you want to be a, a successful business owner. The second myth is um, build it and they will come. It's like, hey, you know, you don't really need the sales force. You don't need to do marketing. Some people say, hey, just, just do product-led growth or do, do, do a product so good people will come to it or it will go viral and be very successful. Uh, not so much. Uh, again, that's the exception, not the rule. This is a list of unicorns. It's a little bit um, dated, but, but the, the, the key message is if you look at this list, it's actually a list of decacorns, um, uh, companies that at the time were worth $10 billion or more. Uh, you will see two really uh, key pieces of information. What's one that's relevant to this conversation, which is that the business model of all these companies is a business model that gets people to pay for the service they receive. So your customers pay you for the value they find in your service or in your product, as opposed to you build an audience and you build some buzz and momentum and then somebody else pays for you to keep that audience entertain. By the way, the second really notable data points to, to take away from this uh, table is that half of these decacorns are from the US, but then the other half are from is from China. So paying customers is really uh, what, what will drive um, your, your business success, which means you need to build a sales force, you need to build a marketing department to go after uh, your market. So it's kind of the you know, uh, brilliant basics or boring basics, depending on whether you look at the glass half full of ha or half empty. But the, the point is to build a successful business, you have to go through the grind of acquiring customers, generating revenue. And then the third uh, point I want to make, uh, we're in a webinar, so I, I cannot uh, have you um, 
uh, chime in on that, but I'm going to assume that there's at least one of these two guys that, that you know the name of, and that it's the person on the left, Warren Buffett. Um, and then my next question uh, in, a, in a more kind of a collaborative format is uh, uh, who would you take money from? Inevitably, one person will raise their hand and say the other guy. And, and let me tell you, you don't want money from the other guy. In fact, I would never invest in a company if you want money from the other guy, because that tells me that you do not want to surround yourself with money that's more than money, money that's value add. And when you think about what you know, an investor, like a you know, smart money, like an investor like Warren Buffett can bring, it's tremendous, right? Warren Buffett's investments are more successful partly because he can pick them well, but partly because the fact that he picks them will bring other investors, will bring higher quality higher, will convince customers to get on board, will validate the market. It will be like a, a big reputation builder. So there is a lot of value in, in smart money. And smart money doesn't come easy. Smart money comes after extensive due diligence. In fact, when you look at research, there's a direct correlation between the amount of due diligence an investor does on your company and the success of that company. So the more questions you get, the more due diligence is done, the greater your chances of success. This is a screenshot that summarizes the approach that Warren Buffett takes when he makes due diligence. He first gets a strong understanding of the business. He looks at the company valuation to make sure he gets a good deal. He looks at the, the market dynamics to see whether he, he would be investing in a, in a growing space or, or what are the, the, the general like socioeconomic um, and industry dynamics. He looks at the competition, he looks at the team. And then once he's done his due diligence uh, based on these principles, then he decides whether to make an investment or not. And so the, the key lesson here is um, get smart money. And I'll give you an example to, to put that a little bit in, in perspective. Um, I met with this entrepreneur um, not too long ago who you know, comes and pitches to us. And he says, um, you know, we, we've gotten a lot more traction, revenue is going well, we're raising money and so on and so forth. And then at the very end of his presentation, he says, oh, by the way, you know, the other thing I want to mention is we've gotten some interest from a couple of potential acquirers. Okay, so that's pretty major news. Like, how are these opportunities? Well, they are pretty attractive. They would be a really nice bump to the valuation. Uh, they would be a great exit for the entrepreneur. Okay, so why, what are you doing here? Why aren't you pursuing these exit opportunities? Well, I'm not quite sure to go about it. I'm a first-time entrepreneur. Well, okay, so what's your board telling you? Well, that's the problem. I took money from the other guy, right? I didn't take smart money. And so smart money is not able to guide the entrepreneur who's a first-time entrepreneur towards having a successful exit that could be completely life-changing for him and for the company. Uh, and that's a really big lesson that um, I, I cannot emphasize uh, enough. All right, so um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, that's sort of the, the first part, like the Miss Busters. Uh, the Facebook effect or the Facebook model, it, it's not replicable. And what you want is you want to study hard, you want to do you know, business basics, and you want to get smart money. So uh, now that we, we've uh, kind of uh, discussed that you know, the, the, the dream or the, the, um, the myth of uh, getting rich quick in, in Silicon Valley is, um, is sort of not really a reality, then, okay, so how do you actually get money? And I mentioned, I'm gonna do for the rest of this section, a parallel between how you sell your product to a customer versus how you sell your equity to an investor, i.e. how you raise money. Before I jump into this, I am happy to take a few questions. And so I'm gonna, Hey, Christine. Hi. Um, looks like there's no question right now, but I have one question. You mentioned about uh, raising money from the smart money. And oftentimes when you're just starting, you did not have that option. And how do you go about that and then fix it later? Yeah. 
That's a great question. So, and, and that's something I, I was gonna cover definitely. How do you get these investors intro? And it's not, you know, everything doesn't come all at once, right? It's, a, it's a all, always an ongoing process. So th that said, there are three kinds of referrals that you want for uh, possible investment. The first kind is you get referred to another investor by one of your existing investors, not by an investor who has not invested in you, by an investor who has invested in you. You do not want uh, an investor who does not invest in you to make a, an introduction because essentially what that person would say, you know, hey, Christine, I want to send you this deal. I'm not going to invest, but I really think you should. It's mm -hmm. not going to fly, right? So you really want to get introductions from investors to investors only if that person has invested in your company. The second kind of introductions that you want is introductions from uh, people who are not investors but have expertise in your industry or like the specific you know, um, company uh, segment that, that your category you're building. And the kind of introduction you want from them is, I'm an expert in blockchain or health AI or what have you. And I believe this entrepreneur is doing something awesome, but I'm not an investor. I'm just referring this opportunity to you for your consideration because based on my expertise, I think there is a there there. Um, and then the third kind of intro you want is from an entrepreneur who has received money from an investor saying, hey, Mr. In, in, or Mrs. Investor, you invested in me. I think this entrepreneur is just like me. I, I think you should take a look at this opportunity. Okay, cool. Well, that's good. Let's see. I think this, there's a couple. Yeah, another question from David. He's, he's hey, saying, David. <laughs> in your perspective on due diligence by investor in a in Theranos, not sure if you are familiar with that. Yes. <laughs> so of course Theranos is, um, you know, it is in the press like all over because um, because of you know it's the exception and not the rule. In a situation like that, you know, um, a lot of people relied on a lot of other people uh, who relied on a lot of other people. <laughs> And, and the due diligence was never really done. Um, how it's possible, um, it's hard to explain. I mean, I, you know, I'm familiar with the case. I, I actually teach a, a course on, on governance at the Stanford Executive Extension. We invited uh, one of the councils who was involved in the, in the case. So it's really, you know, and now there's the ongoing investigation. So obviously it's a, it's a complicated situation. The key lesson for, for me there is as an investor, you never want to rely on other people to form your own opinion. You always want to have some form of primary information uh, and, and really understand what risks you are willing to take. So for example, if you say, I will take a technology risk, then it's on you to make your own assessment of the technology. If you say, I will not make a technology risk, then you need somebody else to validate it, say there, the technology risk you know, uh, has been you know, eliminated, and then you can move on to evaluate other risks that you are willing to take. Um, yes, it's, um, it's a very you know, odd situation that's driven by a lot of uh, hype and FOMO. So uh, when you think of the, the pool of companies, um, just to put, put that in perspective with numbers, there's about 100,000 venture funded companies at any point in time. And about 5,000 of them exit via an acquisition, about 500 exit via a public listing, whether it's you know IPO, SPAC, direct listing, what have you. And then there's gonna be you know, a Theranos somewhere mm -hmm. there. But that's really the exception. Yeah. Okay. Which is good. Um, do you want to take on more questions? Yeah. Let's take a couple more. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, another question. Going back to the non-smart money, if you already receive non-smart money, is there a way to get a smaller investment from smart money such that they come on board? Yes, of course. So, you know, when you're starting your business and you have to do what you have to do, um, it, you know, I'm not saying do not take the, the smart money when it's there. I'm saying do seek this, uh, do not take the, the, the dumb money when it's there. <laughs> do seek the smart money is, is really what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying here. So money is money if you need it. Maybe one thing I could say there, uh, often when I talk to entrepreneurs, especially first time entrepreneurs, they say, oh yeah, I wanna raise $3 million to get to the next stage. And my first reaction is, wow, that seems like another money. How much do you really need? And the answer inevitably is sub 1 million. It's like, I need really five, 600,000. So why are you raising 3 million? You're gonna get diluted. You're gonna have a lot of investors on your back before you're sort of ready to, to generate the, the revenue, the traction, the infrastructure to support that. Just raise about a million dollars. It's a, first of all, it's a lot easier to raise uh, you know, a million than to raise three. You'll get better terms. You'll, you'll keep more control and ownership of your company. And, um, and there is a time for a good time, but when it's super early, um, you know, take a little bit of money, go move forward, generate revenue, build something that people want. And then when you know that, and you've built that on a very capital efficient basis, then it's good time. Then you can go raise, you know, 10 million and, and more beyond that. There seems to be a need or desire on the part of investors for things looking bigger, better, brighter, which was certainly a motivation behind OZ Media. I don't know what OZ Media is. Yes. So we, we're going to get into this um, in the next section. There's always a song and dance with investors. And um, one of the biggest shift from the entrepreneur or operator mindset to the investor mindset is as an operator or CEO entrepreneur, your job is to say yes to things, right? Yes, Mr. Customer will, will deliver. Yes, you know, Mrs. Regulator will, will meet the criteria. Yes, we'll hire that person. Yes, we'll be on time. Yes, we'll make that adjustment. The job of an investor is to say, no, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, we can't do that deal. No, this is too much of a risk, right? So it's a completely different mindset. And that's the, the song and dance. That's kind of the, the clash that can happen sometimes. So if you go to an investor and you say, and I, I've had the, the two situations, you say, hey, uh, I'm, um, you know, with COVID, um, things have been really difficult working remotely for my team. Uh, we've had some attrition, and then we've also lost a few customers. So, God, you know, I really want to raise $3 million so that I can get back on track. Well, you've just given me, I don't know, five reasons to say no. <laughs> That's my job to say no. You only need to give me one. So really the story you need to tell is, you know, We've had some bumps on the road with COVID, but we've overcome them. We've developed a culture as a distributed team. We've had to you know, transition some people out, bring some people in, and now we have a fantastic culture. Here are some examples of how we've developed it. We've also had to you know, reinvent uh, some of our good market to go after bigger, smaller, different customers. And now we're on track after this, you know, small pivot to, to generate a lot of revenue and we have two quarters of tractions to generate it. So now what I'm doing is I'm raising a little bit more money to prove that my trajectory is gonna be you know, solid, sustainable for kind of a post-pandemic world. Same story, but sold completely differently where the second time you're actually not giving me a lot of reasons to say no, right? You've hit bumps on the road, you're going to hit bumps on the road anyways, you've tackled them very effectively, you're showing me resilience, you're telling me the train has left the station and you can get on it if you want. Like Now I'm like, okay, so mm -hmm. I'm, I wanna do due diligence, I wanna dig deeper into this opportunity. That's a really important song and dance. Yeah. But the mindset shift, right? The always yes and always no, 
is what you really want to be mindful of. Yeah, I think probably this is a good segue for you to uh, to uh, to tell us more about that. Okay, let's do that, and then we can take more questions yeah. um, at the end. So. Um, to, uh, to dive into that next segment, um, many of you are probably familiar with the four Ps of building great products, product, price, promotion, placements. Um, and I've added a fifth one, which is people, which honestly should come first uh, in any situation. Um, I'm not sure why the four Ps omitted the, that fifth P. So the four P, and we'll go into each of them, um, is product. And when you fundraise, your product is your business. So I'll give you a very, very simple tool called the business equation to communicate what this product that is your business, what it is. Uh, price, your price in the case of fundraising is your valuation. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, how, how you negotiate that. Promotion, we uh, kind of talked about already, which is you always want warm introductions from these three kinds of people, uh, investors who have invested in you, um, advisors who are experts in a particular domain that, that you know, you're building your company into and uh, who introduce you to investors and then uh, entrepreneurs in, a, in an investor's portfolio. And then placement, uh, we'll talk about the mindset uh, of investors, the yes versus the no and a couple of other things. And finally, uh, management team, what are some of the things that we look for in uh, strong management teams? So diving into this, um, so first product, the product when you're raising money is equity. You're selling your equity to investors. And so equity sits on, the, on this kind of, um, of thing called a balance sheet, right? And a balance sheet, the, the very simple characteristic of a balance sheet is assets equal equity, right? And liability at a startup, you generally don't have debt. So it's like total assets equal total equity. And so to make your investors happy, you wanna grow your equity, which means that you wanna grow your assets. To grow your assets, it's the cash, it's the account receivable, stuff like that. You want customers, it's that simple, right? So if you wanna have bigger value for your equity, if you wanna make your investors happy, give them you know, uh, increased value in their equity, you have to generate revenue. So the next question is, how do I generate revenue? Again, extremely simplified, but if you come to an investor with that approach, it's like so simple, it makes their lives very, very easy. So revenue, it's you know, when you think about economics 101, volume times price, and volume, uh, depending on the kind of business you're in, you can be in a, like a high velocity business where you have one customer, who buys a lot of your product, like an e-commerce type stuff, or you can be in a low velocity business where one customer buys one of your product, like a car, for example, very few people have, you know, seven Mercedes. <laughs> so you buy one, you know, one customer, one car, uh, generally speaking. So to generate revenue, it's that equation, that revenue equation or product equation, call it whatever you want. It's number of customers, times number of transactions per customer times revenue per transaction. Again, super simple, but if you're able to articulate how you're gonna get more customers, then you have an acquisition strategy. How you're gonna get them to be more engaged with your product, buy more often, right? Increase the number of transactions per customer. Then you have an engagement strategy and then how you're gonna monetize that engagement uh, by you know, maximizing the revenue per transaction, then you have a monetization strategy. And if you simply outline, hey, Mrs. Investor, Mr. Investor, this is how I'm gonna get more customers. This is my acquisition strategy. This is how I'm gonna engage them more effectively this is my engagement strategy, get more transactions out of one customer. This is how I'm gonna monetize them fairly, my monetization strategy per transaction you have a very strong case for how you're gonna make revenue, therefore how you're gonna increase the equity value. Of course, this is hyper simplified. You, uh, you can tell me, wait a minute, I have multiple revenue streams. So my product equation or my revenue equation has multiple um, uh, elements. 
uh, or you know, I work in the hardware industry, so I have a cost line. So you shouldn't be really talking about revenue. You should be talking about profit or, or gross margin. Yes, to all of that. I'm really just simplifying here because we don't have a ton of time. But the, the key message is show your investor how you're gonna grow revenue and it's gonna tell them how you're gonna grow their equity. That's how you get them to love you. The second P is price. And price is um, valuation of your company. So this photo, this photo is a photo of the motorbike of my husband. He races them, he loves it. And this is a photo that he took after a race. So he you know, goes to friends, they, ha they have this really nice outdoor space, puts the motorbike, takes a nice picture. It's like heaven. I, I, I'm not in the picture, it's really heaven. And, um, and for him, that experience is completely priceless. But for me, it has a cost. And the cost is really like, it's right here. You know, when we go to the dealership to, you know, buy one of these uh, little babies, right? Like a, a Ducati, you have a, a list price on the windshield and that's what you think you're paying. But the truth is when you come out of the dealership, you pay a lot more. And uh, the total cost of ownership of a motorbike is really high because you pay for repairs, you pay for maintenance, you pay for insurance, you pay for some security support, whatever it is, uh, that total cost of ownership is, is a lot higher than the list price on the bike. And it's the same thing with um, term sheets in venture capital. Your uh, list price is the valuation. A lot of entrepreneurs get really, um, you know, uh, tight around the valuation, but the really uh, important piece to look at is the total cost of ownership, which is valuation plus the terms. And why it's important, because if you tell me, I think my company is, more, is worth 10, and I think it's only worth say seven, well, I'm gonna add some terms that are gonna make up for the difference. And the terms will protect your investors but they will not protect you as the entrepreneur. And so it's really important that you uh, really look at that total cost of ownership when you think of price, as opposed to just the list price, which is your valuation. The third one we've already mostly talked about, the three kinds of introductions that you need and compare that to what a lot of entrepreneurs, um, especially first time entrepreneurs will do. Um, and you know, think about it as you're, you're marketing to, to investors. You want referrals uh, from these three kind of uh, people, as opposed to you don't want to do online marketing like AngelList, unless you're like super early. And you know, even in circumstances like that, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend it, even though AngelList is a you know, great revolutionary uh, service. Uh, digital marketing and investing is still not um, something that, that is going to get you very far. You also never want to be doing cold calling, like never. Uh, we get at Mighty Capital, we get, I want to say 4,000 inbound deals every year. And out of these 4,000, the ones that are not, you know, referred or, you know, coming in from a warm introduction, um, maybe there's a couple of emails that I read and I'm like, wow, this person really sent me that email after they did a ton of research on Mighty Capital. They really get our value proposition. I'm going to reply. So it's you know, maybe a couple, a couple a year. Um, and then the third thing you do not want to do, uh, and that's particularly true in Silicon Valley until and unless you are much, much later stage is you don't want to do channel marketing, which is go through an investment bank to uh, help you raise the money. It would be generally perceived by most venture uh, investors as a sign of a weak uh, CEO. So um, the, that, that placement piece, uh, Christine, you asked me the question that the mindset of investors is really the, to say no, their jobs to say no. So if you wanna raise money and if you want them to love you, don't give them reasons to say no, always show your resilience, always show your ability to, to overcome obstacles and generate traction and increase that equity piece by increasing the revenue piece. Um, one thing to remember 
uh, or, or maybe that's something that can be helpful as well is that there's actually a lot of different kinds of investors. And so when you ask for introductions, you wanna sort of right size or uh, target your investors effectively. I took this segmentation, the whales, dolphins, and minnows from the kind of the traditional social or gaming segmentations that you may be familiar with. So let me uh, explain what, what I mean here. The whales, the whales in gaming, they are the, um, the folks who, you know, you make most of your money from. They are the ones who buy all your special weapons and you know, do all the, the upsells and buy the super packs uh, with, you know, special coins and, and all of that. They're about 1% of your audience, but they make most of your money, about a third of your money. The dolphins, and I like to think of Mighty Capital as a dolphin, they are the people in, um, who in, in gaming will, uh, you know, you, you'll get a message from them, oh, I think you should really play Candy Crush, you know, and then they'll try to get you in on their really cool stuff. And then if they're not happy with you, they'll also tell you all about it, right? They're like social butterflies. So you really want them in your game or in your social media but you wanna make sure you feed them good things to say about you because that way they will be an evangelist for you. And then the minnows uh, in most sort of gaming and social, they're like about 90% of your audience and they are here kind of just for the show. So they're the lurkers on, on Facebook or, or on Instagram who are just gonna scroll through but not really get engaged. And, um, and, and they're great that you need them but they cannot do very much for you. Same thing with investors. Whales, they will write a big check, but then the way you keep them happy is you know, they, they kind of own you, right? You'll do whatever they want. Dolphins, they help you navigate an ecosystem. So if you play in that ecosystem, you really want their help because they'll help you get faster through the, you know, the muddy waters of that, that ecosystem. And then the minnows, you want some of them, but not too many because they, they can waste your time um was just like they're here for the show and and they're excited for you but because they cannot do too much for you uh they, they can be um a, a waste of your time and then finally management team so um management team or founding team um a lot of folks you know think of uh early stage entrepreneur like how do i find a co-founder when you're a little bit more established, like how do I bring in executives on my, my early leadership team? Um, so I, I learned these kind of three criteria that, that I look for based on, on my own experience looking for a co-founder uh, a few years ago before, before investing. I, I, was, you know, I started a company and I was looking for a co-founder um, and basically ended up saying, uh, long story short, Rather than go to a bunch of you know, meetups and look for a co-founder like the hard way, I'm going to actually create my own ecosystem of uh, you know, co-founders and uh, do matchmaking. But then I'm going to get first pick at the matchmaking. And so I got an opportunity to interview thousands of you know, founders who were looking for co-founders. And, and these are the, the three key criteria that I found were critical to a successful pair. One is you want a complementary skill set. So not just engineers, not just salespeople, like bring some uh, complementarity into your, your team. Two is you want compatible communication style. Uh, there's gonna be arguments, there's gonna be differences no matter what. The question is, how do you come out of it? Um, can you come out of it? So compatibility is super important. And then three is comparable risk profile, which means really you wanna go after the same dream. Your dreams have to be, the size of your dreams have to kind of match. Um, and that's actually really, really important. If you pair up with somebody who, you know, is gonna be very happy building a company for a couple of years, selling it for, or, or three or something, selling it for 20 million because then they're gonna be able to buy, you know, five Ducatis and go racing around the world versus you wanna build something that's gonna go IPO and change the world. You're never gonna be a good pair because along the way, 
as you're building the business, let's say somebody comes in and says, I want to acquire your company for $100 million. Your co-founder is going to be all over the moon. That's five times bigger than my dreams. And you're going to look down and say, excuse me, nothing but IPO. And you're going to kill that deal. So very important, the, the risk profile and the alignment of like sizing your dreams. Um, and I think that's it for this uh, slide deck. I'm gonna stop the share and we can take the rest of, um, of the time for, for questions. Yeah, okay. There's a few questions here. Uh, let's start with, well, Vitaly want to know what areas are you interested in investing in for S uh, and Mighty Capital? Yeah, so we typically invest at uh, Series A. And uh, what, can, what can I say there? Uh, series A, mostly uh, in the US. And then we will look at, uh, you know, B2B tech. We will look at health AI. We, would look at, we will look at FinTech, blockchain. Um, so, yeah. The value really... Uh, that we bring and something that's important to us is we give you access to you know, over 300,000 product managers. If you think you can make use of that, then I would absolutely love to talk with you. Right. Uh, another question. I think there's a lot of question around the cold email, cold calling. Uh, what should one do if they are looking lacking in connection for warm introduction to investors since cold email are not that effective. Yes, so you already have more connections than you think. You already know Christine, you're already part of her network. You know, maybe I'm not gonna put you on the spot, Christine, but I'm sure you have a network of mentors who will talk to entrepreneurs. You, you have some companies that you feature at your showcase. So find a way to, to get noticed a, a little bit this way and that you can do Cold um, and maybe Christine, that's something that you can uh, you can dive into. But once you're in that ecosystem, then you know Christine is keeping in touch with with me, with many other venture firms. And when she sees an opportunity that she thinks has potential, she will be delighted to to send it. Say, SC, you should look at this because that is going to make her um, uh, institute more successful, increase her reputation. So. You start with some of the influencers in the network. They will introduce you to advisors. So that's you know the that second type of person, expert in a field who may not be investors but have a reputation for spotting companies early. And that's Christine, right. feel free to add to that. No, that's right on. I'm glad that you you said that. Uh, part of the benefit of joining our the Rosemary Innovators program, a lot of different programs that we went through we help our entrepreneur by connecting them with the early stage investors. Um, but again, it's, it's like you have to go through the program as well because we have, we have the opportunity to get to know the company and select the company who we want to support um, into our, to our program. So, okay, next question. There's a lot of this introduction question. So I think that covered it. Uh, if you can use the mission bios investment on how to, uh, the, to show the product equal equity evaluation example, and did they have revenue at that time? Maybe you can give context about your, the mission bio company. I think that would be helpful as well. Yes. And mission bio, Christine, I think they, they worked with your program as well. Yeah. So um, Mission Bio is a company that we've known for a long time. Um, they're incredibly, I mean, smart people, incredibly um, innovative product. Um, we invested before they had revenue. And, you know, our investments in, in, in health AI and health platforms are slightly different than the rest of our investments because we obviously don't always have to see revenue there. Um, but yes, Charlie Silver, who was the CEO at the time is, is phenomenal, uh, really, really brilliant guy. 
I see a lot of these questions about cold call and email. So the reason I give you my email is so you you contact me if you think you have a, a an opportunity that that I'd like to to hear about. So you can you know in your subject say hey Rosenma Rosenman uh, follow up or that that's that's not that's not a cold email. Um, okay, great. A uh, question from Bill: Which ventures? follow Mighty Capital when you guys lead? And yeah, which so, venture that Mighty Capital follow? Yes. So we co-invest with um, a lot of the, the top firms. We've co-invested with Benchmark, Mayfield, Homebrew, USVP, um, and a bunch of others. Um, we, we don't... Um, you know, we're, we're not a, a, a selective. We, we work with people that we know and trust. Uh, we rarely lead deals, or sorry, I should say, we have not led a lot of deals in the past, but now, um, and partly because Mighty Capital uh, is a relatively young firm, but now we're increas increasingly invited to lead deals. Uh, and so we, um, we are able to do that. We have... Um, the funds uh, required to do that. And, and to give you some context, you'll find a lot of um, uh, more um, like sophisticated investors will be hesitant to lead rounds when they have small funds. Because imagine, you know, I fund you, but I have a very small fund and I say, oh, sure, I'm gonna lead, it's great for my ego. But then when you actually need me to put up more money, oh, sorry, my pockets are empty. It, it would be really, um, really bad for you and really bad for us. So now we have, you know, bigger funds and we're able to lead and our entrepreneurs uh, very often want us to do that. Okay, great. Uh, question from Rachel. How do you think about right time to seek Series A in MedTech when product development and FD clearance takes longer? And customer needs to wait until the yeah. end. Yes. Yeah, so um, we, if you're if you're gonna if you're if you're building therapeutics, that's totally out of my out of my league. If you're building health AI, um, generally we will want to see some revenue because we we believe that it's mostly a software play, even though you may be leveraging data that are you know, life science data. And so you should be able to sell uh, your, your product and, and generate revenue. If you're uh, building, um, you know, like a platform or a medical device, uh, there are some regulatory requirements there. So we wanna see you um, get grants, get extremely capital efficient, as in extremely capital efficient. Uh, we wanna see you extend your runway, um, leverage university partnerships. Um, and then when you get closer to an FDA approval process, that's when we typically see companies raise a uh, series A. Okay, question from Ivan. Other than capital, what guidance and assistance does Mighty Capital offer to the founders? Yes. So um, I encourage you to uh, check out in more detail what our entrepreneurs are saying about Mighty Capital. Um, the value we bring, uh, you, when you think of the value of venture capital, there's really three things. There's money, money looks the same for everyone. There's governance, which means that, you know, value investor will bring very qualified board members to the table. And we have some phenomenal ones. We have you know, people who were at the very senior level at Sequoia Hospital, who founded and, and run and sold their own clinics. Um, so that's that's one way that you're going to evaluate the, the, the value of a firm. Um, and then the third one is advice and, and other value add. And for that, you want to think of this product network. About 20% of the network is product uh, managers who are working in the life science space, so healthcare, um, uh, health in, in, in general. And so we can give you access to all these people through a variety of, you know, newsletter, uh, executive salon, uh, ebooks, what have you. 
um, so that you get exposure to, to that audience in your own industry. But yeah, when you think about you know, evaluating venture capital firms, you can evaluate money, governance, and advice. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where the smart money is, right? <laughs> right. Uh, next question comes from Tara. How does your group weigh team diversity in background and experience in your funding decision? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. So our policy uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusion is actions speak louder than words. And so what it means is um, we, uh, and, and if you look on our website, you will see we're an extremely diverse team. We, we look nothing like the, the traditional um, venture capital firm. We have diversity across, you know, gender, age, religion, race in our investment team. Um, but if we, uh, if we spoke about diversity, that would become our job just because we are so diverse. And so we, we, we be uh, diverse. And I, and I prefer to say, to be honest, I prefer to say inclusive rather than diverse. Um, and as a result of this uh, high inclusion, our portfolio is also um, a very inclusive and, and diverse portfolio. We have CEOs, again, you know, different gender, different age, different race, different geography. And that's not by design. That's because we have a diverse investment team. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Next question from Iris. Iris. So if you've done an initial pitch with an investor and they're not getting back to you with a decline or their interest in moving forward, what's an effective way to get them to respond? Well, I hate it when people don't get back to me. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's an interesting question. Uh, if people don't get back to you, um, there's probably a reason. And so sometimes it's because they're busy, but sometimes it's because, you know, they're just not interested. Or sometimes it's because they don't actually have the money to, uh, to invest. And so um, we, we, on our team, we have a, a policy for follow-up. We say, you know, you do three follow-ups every other day, or maybe another one after that, maybe a week later. And then if you don't hear back, then, you know, it is what it is. Um, don't hesitate to follow up though, because it could be, and you know, this is just part of everybody has their own way to evaluate deals. Uh, it could be that some investors are, you know, kind of uh, doing this as a bit of a test. Do they really need and want the money? So define your follow-up policy and follow it. And it's really nothing personal. Yeah. By the way, we we have, um, yeah, I, I started saying I really hate that. At Mighty Capital, we have a, a, an entire system so that we get back to our entrepreneurs when they pitch within a couple of days. Because when I was an entrepreneur myself, I, I really did not appreciate the, the sign and treatment. So I think it's really important to build the right reputation as an investor, but you know, that's not for me to judge how other people um, handle their business. Yeah, I, if only I wish everybody had the same manner, that would be nice. <laughs> Next question from Sean, how important is IP when considering an investment for you? Yes, in the, in the space of life science, it's really important. In the space of software, a lot less so. So why? Uh, because obviously it's a reason for the bigger fish to buy the smaller ones. Uh, and it's also a reason to have a defensible um, solution. So um, I would say for most of your listeners, Christine, who probably are um, in the life science space, I, I would I would say it's important. Okay, a uh, question from Philip. Was your thought of setting and communicating your business plan equal to your exit strategy to your investor? For example, focus on technology play to sell the company after its product verification, rather than focus on customer acquisition of the product and building sales force. This is assuming the market is already validated and convinced by the potential acquirer. Yes. 
So that's a great question. In the in the life science space, there's um, definitely a, a key trigger point once you have the the technology taken care of. Am I gonna you know go to market? standalone or am I going to find a home now and use their uh, Salesforce to go to market? Um, you know, from, from an investor perspective, what an investor will want is for them to, for you to show them that they have a, a good upside. And so if you're close to that point of um, deciding that you want to find a home, then you want to raise money like earlier, like 18 to 24 months before, so that the investors who put in money, they have a good upside, right? What you don't want to do is you don't want to come in like in your say three, six months before that key milestone and you're running out of cash because then you put yourself and, and your investors in a, in a difficult situation. You're going to typically come back and say, hey, previous investor, you trusted me and, uh, you know, things are taking longer, which is to be expected. Um, but I'm going to need more money, which is, is um, yeah, if it comes last minute, it, it's not a fun situation. No fire drill. Last question. Oh, I think we have, uh, we can uh, have a quick answer to this last question so that we can finish on time. That'd be great. Do you prefer to invest in a team that is not complete, that you get an opportunity to put in your people? Or do you prefer to have a more complete team? Most of the time, it's up to the CEO to build their team. Um, the, this question would be relevant or the answer would be different if we were a private equity firm and we would you know, place our people in your company. Um, but for most venture capitalists, they don't take controlling states stakes in a company and they don't place their people, we will put you in touch with a ton of them, but then it, it's your choice who you bring on board and how you build your team. Right, okay. Well, with that, let's uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your time, sharing your insight. And thank you everybody for uh, listening and joining the program. Thanks, Christine, for having me. That was fun. And good luck, everyone. Keep building great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.